question for both of you regarding the kind of satisfaction you look for as a viewer, because uh, you may like a typology of very different kinds of satisfactions. And uh, you said that out of 10, you have eight who picked a positive scene. Yes. I don't know what it means positive, uh, as opposed to two who chose a negative scene. What I feel in what you say is that uh, the two people who chose what you call a negative scene found a paradoxical satisfaction in it. And uh, uh, the satisfaction doesn't mean uh, simple pleasure. Uh, it can be something different. Could you give us an example of what a negative scene satisfaction yeah, can yeah, be? Yeah. So it reminds me of two American scholars. They, they, they had made a, a research on, on meaningful film moments, and they actually make a theory about mixed, mixed feelings. Mm. So they, they analyzed uh, some uh, tragic films, and so it was not a surprise that, that people felt deep meaning combining happiness and sadness. So the main theme in their research was the combination of happiness and sadness uh, creating satisfaction. It was a satisfactory experience because it was this tragedy. Because it's deep. It's deep. Yeah, that's why. What was more interesting when they analyzed the people who have picked comedies, they could also detect, even in comedies, the people, when they actually uh, analyzed the people's responses, was also a mixture of happiness and sadness. So you could have expected that it was completely happiness, 100% happiness. No, even in the comedies, the, the feeling of, of affection and, and satisfaction dealt with the, the combination of, of happiness and sadness. So mixed effect is their theoretical word for, for when, when films are actually conceived to be meaningful, which is really, that is a general to be generalized for, for storytelling. You have to create some kind of a mixed effect. Otherwise, it becomes redundant or, or transparent and, and uninteresting. What we know in cognitive science is about, what you speak about is availability of a certain number of memories. And you would say that this scene uh, is more accessible because uh, it has been encoded and is very available. And most of the time when this occurs is because there is a strong emotion attached to it. Uh, you always know, you, everybody remembers where each of us were at the time of September 11, if we were born. Uh, the fact is that uh, um, because it was such a strong emotion that you coded it very strongly, um, uh, your memory is stored with everything around. You will never remember, or, uh, for instance, when you learned that uh, Paris is the capital of France. You know, it's a generic knowledge. You know, it, it, there is no emotion attached to it. And uh, so it's, a, it's some kind of a declarative uh, yeah. uh, knowledge, which is semantic, that gives meaning, you know, but it, it's not attached to any specific event. So probably what is important also is uh, all these people, it's not if the emotion is negative, positive, neutral or whatever, uh, but it's an emotion and it's, hard, it's hard coded because at the end of the day, it's, um, the, the experience uh, is attached to, to a strong and true feeling that makes the memory very alive and very accessible. I agree, I agree. So the satisfaction is about intensity. Yes. I would say it can be positive, negative, satisfactory, disturbing. Uh, uh, the only problem is when it's neutral. When it's neutral, it becomes, you know, the fact that it's a scene within the, the movie which gives meaning to the whole thing, but at the end of the day, which you don't remember, because at the end of the day, it, uh, it, it doesn't trigger much in terms of uh, your own uh, feelings. But there is another uh, angle to this satisfaction. It's uh, the old catharsis theory, the, the Aristotle's catharsis, that you, you get rid of negative feelings during a tragedy. By or, feeling them. By, by feeling. But there is a new discussion that no, maybe it's not getting rid of negative feeling. It's reconceptualizing. You rethink, you're rethinking a conflict. You're not getting rid of the feelings, but you're reconceptualizing your, your understanding of the conflict. And that could be another way of, of, of understanding the catharsis. So you understand differently? Yes. 
So it's a, like a change of view that exactly. gives you satisfaction. Exactly, and that that makes more sense to to the research I'm doing in, in uh, among my viewers than merely to to steam off negative feelings. No, it's not about that only. It, it, it's it's a rethinking, a new new views on on your own conflict and your, on your own life. That makes more sense than than the, the old maybe cliche idea of, of catharsis, getting, steaming off negative feelings. A question for you, when you interviewed people, so they chose voluntarily, they just, you said, uh, would you pick of a movie which was important to you and a scene within the movie? So that means that at the end of the day, it was a question of, uh, uh, they, they gave you, you know, what was the most, uh, exactly. uh, uh, without going back to the movie, they knew what movie they were talking about and what scene within the movie they were talking about, or did they need to review it to discover what, uh, what they, 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 were, they were stricken about? Um, well, it's an important question because it, it was important that it was on their choice. So I had this questionnaire uh, and I asked people, I picked people who have seen the film at least three times so they have had a, a repetition of going back to the movie and then I knew that I could ask why did you return to this one? So there is a pick, a selection from, from their own choice uh, and then when I had the movie and uh, uh, they also had to pick the scene which on their choice I don't know if they, they watched the movie once more before we talked, but I watched the movie uh, the night before we, we, we had the interview. But since some of them have watched the movie 30 times, they, they knew it by heart, so, so they, hadn't, uh, they didn't need to, to, to watch it once more time. So it's a real genuine, it's a question of, of scholarly method, methodology. I, I would have a question. Is it, uh, do you think it is possible to, uh, to think of a, is, is there the possibility to talk about engagement? Can a film be engaging without emotions? Uh, just a question to end on that question of emotions. Um, Descartes says in, in his Treaty of Passions that the first emotion that's like the source of all other emotions is um, admiration. admiration. Mm -hmm. uh, if you admire something and Admiration, it takes it in the Latin sense. Uh, ad mirari means to look at something new. And he says that novelty is the first way to trigger uh, the basis of all emotions. <coughs> Do, are you okay with that? Does the brain really function like that? If it's new, then you, you look at it and then you build emotions on it. I think it's good to, to just taste the different words we have for emotion. We have moods, sentiments, feelings, emotions, affects. And uh, often in, in the English speaking world, they, they can use mood for, for a background feeling. The, the, the film is melancholic or optimistic or joyful. And that, that, I think that that is good to, to think about, the, the mood. Sentiments. It's, a, it's an interesting uh, concept because we have sentimental. And uh, I've read some books about uh, how to, to understand the, the sentimental mode of, of tear jerkers, the, the American word tear jerker. When it, it's the melodramatic filmmaking. Uh, and, and tear jerkers are supposed to be women movies back in the days, uh, 40, 50, 60 years ago. But now they, uh, the, this scholar, Carl Plantinga, he is talking about male tear jerker movies. For example, Gladiator. Gladiator is, is one a typical masculine tear jerker. Or Spartacus, the old Spartacus, that, that men, men can cry about the, the self sacrifice and, and the, the, the honor of, of the, the warriors and the gladiators. And that's another take uh, how to deal with uh, tear jerker and sentimental films. Which is interesting for the mainstream public, but, but for, for arty directors and scriptwriters, it's, you don't want to be uh, and <laughs> mingling with that. <laughs> mingling with that <laughs> because it's simple and, and uh, simple minded. But I, I think the opposite. No, it should be very interesting to, when, when you are actually doing something that has this deep resonance in, in sentiment, even sentimental feelings. It, 
There can it's be a purity about it. It there is. So you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't distaste uh, the sentiments right off. But there is this discrepancy of, of high culture, low culture. And sentimental movies and tearjerkers are in, in the low culture. So that you have to struggle with that when you enter into this field of, of emotions also. That's an aspect of it. We talk about all these different types of uh, emotions, how to categorize it. But to, um, isn't the word stimulus, you know, the, the, because is the, is the game, is, is there a need to generate a stimulus? I think yes. Um, a stimulus, I mean, if you want to create, uh, I mean, if you're in front of a viewer, you as a filmmaker, writer, um, or arousal. Arousal yes. is, is a, a word. Stimuli is a basic word in psychology, mm -hmm. you know, for pe a piece of information. So yes. No That's stimuli, what I'm no processing, nothing. Exactly. That's, That's what I the want starting to point. Come. Yeah. Yeah. That's the starting point. <laughs> Meaning that because. But uh, you're not talking about emotion right here. You're no stimuli. Stimuli, mm. stimuli can mm. be visual, uh, auditory, mm. it can be. Uh, anything. Anything. Yes. And stimulus creates arousal, maybe. Yeah. Excitement, yeah. if it works, yeah. and then you are on the track. Yes, yes. But so the question becomes, what do you stimulate? Because let me tell you, it's very rare for uh, writers in the while they write to be asking themselves, what is the nature of the stimulus they generate for the other? Yeah. No, no. The, the 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 stimulus they create is very clear. It's. Uh, uh, visual and auditory. So, the, so they, 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 they are using uh, uh, verbal and auditory you know, stimuli and, uh, and visual stimuli. This is their tools. That's physics. That's, that's the yeah, physics that's of cinema. <laughs> that's exactly right. There's a picture a physics, and yeah. there's sound <laughs> yes, most of the right. time. That's right. But, but beyond that, because you can have a picture and you can have sound without stimulating anything. This is why we have to be, to be careful with words. Yeah. Stimuli in psychology is a piece of information. That's it. And then you have stimulation. What you are titillating, what, ah. you, are, what you are, uh, what you are uh, provoking, provoking yes. which is stimulation probably. So Anton is talking about stimulation. Yes. What stimulates, <laughs> uh, what makes the mind and the emotion of the viewer moves. But we can get one step uh, removed because some script writers could say for a very long time there is nothing said. It's only pictures, it's only the sound of the wind, it's only, you know, or for a very, uh, 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 for a certain period, it would be words only and quick uh, mm. uh, um, uh, questions and answers or uh, uh, quick interventions of, uh, uh, of the characters and so on. So they have to play with the stimuli, and they don't have an infinite uh, number of stimuli. It's only the ones we mentioned. And then that will create in the, in the viewer a certain number of uh, uh, psychological events. Um, but for example, stimulus, uh, the, the montage, when you have a, a man's, do you, you know about the Kuleshov effect? Yeah. Yes. Which is interesting. You have a, a man's face, and then you have a, a plate for food, or a dead, uh, a dead body. baby, or, or a beautiful woman. A kiss. It's not a kiss. It's not a kiss. It's on. It's on well, you your made the projection. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, the, the the experiment doesn't work really because you you need the, the narrative context. So if you really replicate this experiment, people are are not able to because the, the main idea is that you see the face and connected to to the next image, you project uh, the significance some kind of significance in his face. But it's the, the truth is that you also need the, the, the greater narrative. So you have to be engaged in the greater narrative, which this man's face is part of the narrative. Then you have this uh, projection and, and interpretation of, of if it's a, f a plate or if a baby or, or a woman. So, and that brings us to, to the, the question of, of stimulus inside a, a story. So the story is key. I mean, we, that's why I'm, I'm interested in this, uh, the, the uh, human being as a meaning-making animal. And we are, we are consuming stories, and when we are consuming stories, we are engaged, and the stimulus is inside the, the, the story. And that would be good news for everyone interested in scriptwriting and stories. 
we consume stories. Uh, what is um, very, very important in what you just said with the Kulechov uh, effect is that the face of the, the actor is always the same and it's neutral. Exactly. And then you project anger or sa uh, sadness or um, hunger. desire. Yes. Hunger, yeah, yeah hunger, sadness, uh, desire. Uh, which means that maybe you don't need to build um, empathy uh, to make a, uh, an effect on the audience. You just need to build a situation and to use the, uh, the montage to... Juxtaposition. To provoke an emotion that's not just imitating or feeling what's on the screen. Uh, and this is very important, I think, when you are writing, it's not because you feel very intensely something that you just need to express it uh, to, to make it shareable and understandable. It's different, you have to build something. It's as if me, when I see somebody crying on the screen, I think, okay, they went for the lazy, uh, sentimental uh, <laughs> bullshit, no? So uh, if I see somebody crying, I will refrain, I will inhibit my, my sadness. And if I, if I cry, I'm ashamed of what they did to me. And I say, okay, this is a lazy way to make me cry. But if they show me somebody who's inhibiting his desire to, to, to have tears, to cry, maybe I'll do it. So uh, it's not just about imitating the emotions you see. It's uh, building a it's machine. About provoking the it's emotions. Building a machine generating. to provoke an emotion precisely because you don't show it on the screen. So, and, and I think this is very important to, uh, uh, to that's, point it. That's very important because one of the things is, for example, in theater, you, in the story of theater, you build a situation. So you build a tension, you build a curiosity, you build an appeal for the evolution of the situation. But if you don't have a hero at first, it's not a problem because you already have a stimulation due to the, because of the situation. So the situation is key. And then when we talk about empathy in production or in development, sometimes we forgot to talk about situation. That situation, they have a, a driving force in, in, in them. So that's, that's a okay, important Maybe problem. I could add something about a basic process of the human brain is priming. That means uh, that uh, I don't know the experiment you are talking about it, but I understand that you can, uh, the spectator is projecting some kind of sentiment where... Uh, Depending on uh, what the picture is. Uh, the, 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 the second. The, the, second, the first one or the second one? Both. The, the first one is the same all the time. It's the f face of a woman, neutral. Mm -hmm. No, it's the face of a guy. Uh, it's an actor called Muzjodkin, so it's a, oh, it's yes, a it's guy with a way. face like that. Stone mm -hmm. face. Yeah. No? Stone face. Yeah. yeah. That's right. and, and then the second picture, uh, the first one is like a plate of soup. And they ask the people, what do you feel? What does the actor, actor feel? Feels. Well, the actor feels hunger. And then you take the same image and you put uh, a girl in a coffin or somebody, some dead uh, youngster, what does he feel? He feels sadness. And the last, uh, it's a, a woman on a sofa. What does he feel? Desire. And it's just the same image. So this is what we call priming. That you prime the brain, you know, to uh, get in a certain state and that makes then uh, uh, more available and more automatic a certain number of, uh, 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 of interpretation. So, so uh, this priming effect is very, very strong. Yes, it, it, it allows you, at the end of the day, to go fast or, or, uh, in terms of interpreting what's going on. And probably on, on the constant basis when, when you are screenwriting, you are uh, priming the brain of your viewers uh, to get this or that kind of expectation. Before we conclude, um, what I find really interesting in this example you chose of, uh, in some cases, you have a film where uh, you see the character cry and you feel your, your, as a viewer, you feel you're pushed to cry and you don't want to go there because it's like, come on, you know, don't, don't push me there, it's, it's too artificial. Uh, this goes back to what we often say, the fact that the writer in the writing process often uh, doesn't connect enough to the viewer and, and, and connects most of it, m most of the time with himself or herself. 
And when the writer connects only to himself or herself, uh, he's, he's, he feels, of course, his or her own emotions, and he feels that something very intense is happening. And then he provokes the fact that the scene is going to be their character crying, like the writer is. Yeah. And then you miss the point because then the viewer is rejecting it because you've been too self-centered in your emotional system. Too obvious. Yes. Mm. Whereas if the writer tries to look at the viewer while writing and to take the viewer into account, it means that then the game, instead of being showing your own emotions, it's about provoking the emotions of the other in the other. And then you stop making the character cry because you know that if the character keeps the crying and he should be crying at that moment, then you provoke the fact that the spectator is doing what the character should be doing, which is crying. You know, it's interesting that, so it means that the, the awareness of this ally, which is the spectator working with you, you know, alongside your writing, it's like your, it's, you know, it's your pal, the, the spectator, this abstract being is this human being that you're playing with. And I think in order to generate something which you feel could be artificial, because I don't want to play with the spectator, it, I want to be true, true, true to myself. But then in the meantime, you generate something that sounds artificial for the viewer if you look too much at yourself, in a way. It is said sometimes in the field of screenwriting that the, the audience is more and more educated about storytelling. We hear that sometimes. Is that, do you think that it's, it's true, for example, that people through the years, they learn more and more how a story is made. So the screenwriter has to anticipate this knowledge more and more. So it's more and more difficult to surprise. What, what, mm -hmm. Do you think this is true? Or? Yeah, I think that people are more and more sophisticated and, are, uh, and students uh, are given now lots of uh, vocabulary about uh, <clears throat> how things are written, uh, metaphor, what is a metaphor, what is an understatement, uh, what is uh, uh, an image, uh, and so forth. So, so they even have now technical words to name things. So, so they become uh, more accurate and, and more competent in terms of re receivers, in terms of viewers. Did you identify the, uh, where, what are the different parts, if they are, of, of, the, of the brain, which is used by the receiver part, as opposed as the sender part, as the, the storyteller, the, the kid that inventing a story and telling a story, and the kid being stimulated by a story told by somebody else. Yeah, because it's purely, you know, the mechanism of language, at least for language, it's very clear. There are two, two areas, in the, two different areas of the brain, uh, totally separated. That, uh, but connected, obviously, heavily connected. Uh, one part is taking care of understanding and the other part about uh, expressing. So this is something which has been known for a century and a half, that there are two different parts of the brain who, which are taking care of the two sides of, of the language, uh, understanding and, uh, and expressing oneself. And is it possible, because we, we've, uh uh, been in contact with uh, people, uh, anthropologists working on that topic, and I've never heard about people in the neuroscientific part uh, studying it. The fact that even though our ability as a receiver is seem to be growing because the number of stories that we are facing is growing, um, and in the meantime, because we tell less and less stories in terms of. Uh, you know, everyday life, we are, uh, screens tell stories, and, and we humans, we are not here as, a hu as transmitters of stories that we've uh, heard in the nearby village that we have to transmit to our own village, for instance. Is it, uh, uh, do, 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 um, uh, is it coherent, the, the, the idea that uh, we can be raising our ability to be a receiver and uh, see our ability to be a sender shrink? Well, I would say that uh, people are more and more demanding. So to be a good storyteller, sometimes you need to be a specialist. Uh, and uh, maybe this is uh, 
uh, one point about that. that you, you, you can receive so many different stories for, mm -hmm. from very professional and, uh, and sophisticated people, but to become uh, a proper and, uh, and uh, an experienced storyteller, probably you need more than just being a human being and, and having, you know, uh, to share stories. This is maybe why, you know, we, <coughs> we see this difference coming up. These only assumptions. My experience from, from the, the film school where at my university we have students uh, engaged in, in film production and audiovisual storytelling and it, they are on the production side. And one interesting, uh, I, I've noticed that when we have classes when, when they are supposed to, to pitch an idea or, or to show uh, a small uh, five minute story or something like that, uh, quite often, it's easy to, to point to them that they are actually telling two or three different things. So it's, it's dif difficult for them to focus and to, to know, be aware of themselves in a self-reflective way what they are actually telling, what is the deepest idea. So it's, and and that, is, that goes for every creative uh, worker who are, if you're writing, uh, even if you're writing a scientific piece of paper, you, you can actually have two or three different focuses and then you get criticized because here you're writing this and here you're interested in this. What, what's your subject? What's your topic? And I think that this is also, uh, you can see that uh, among students. So if the viewers are complex, then you have to evaluate and also be very sharp on what you actually want to tell. What do you say about that you, as, as uh, script writers and novelists yourself? Uh, to, do you know when you are in the production side what you are actually telling? Um, it's difficult to answer because if you want to, to, to do something surprising, it must be a surprise to yourself too. So you're kind of uh, the first viewer. But at the same yeah, time, true. at the same time, you've got to know what you intend to do, and so you go back and forth. What is your intent? And if it's too close to the intent, what you do is too obvious, and it's not interesting. You've got to get rid of it. But uh, why are you looking for something, a, a situation? Maybe, maybe you have a goal, and you have to find the right situation to embody it. In situ in a situation, you have to use your imagination and. Uh, um, there are many ways to illustrate the same message. So the message is kind of uh, uh, not necessary. And uh, it, it doesn't say that if your fiction is, is going to have um, enough, enough quality uh, to be not successful, because it's impossible to say when you write something if it's successful, but you can uh, gauge it and you, you can know if it's a success in terms of what you're trying to, uh, maybe not to convey, but the, the mood, no, maybe. Maybe the mood is more important than the, the target. If the, the, the style, no, we, we haven't talked about style a lot, but you, you were talking about being a novelist, but in the, in the screenwriting, the style is not necessarily in the words that are written. The style is the result of um, um, the director's work and the, the, the light. Uh, so it conveys a mood yes. that you can describe. But um, it's difficult when you write a script to have that in, in, your, in your head and to be able to do it. I don't know if you have answered your question, I'm not sure. Well, there is actually an answer in that when you're yeah. dealing with, with creative writing, you, you surprise yourself. And that is actually a difference from, from the focused academic writing. Then you have to get rid of yeah. disturbances. It's not a science. No, exactly. And that's, that is something else.